All right, welcome back to our study of the book of Genesis. We're going to take chapter 48, and Jacob is going to bless Joseph's sons. Now let's jump into the first four verses where Jacob is going to remember God's promise. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. So Luz is going to be another name for Bethel, as we see from chapter 28, verse 19, which says, And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. It's also in chapter 35, verse 6, where it says, So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And that's where Jacob first met God. Jacob vividly remembered this outstanding encounter with the Lord. And so Jacob's phrasing is going to be reminiscent of exact promises that God made to Abraham in chapter 17. In chapter 17, verse 2, it'll say, I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and will make a nation of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. In uh, verse 6 as well. And in uh, verse 8, it'll say, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So Abraham was careful to pass down the exact words of God's covenant with him to the inheritors of the covenant, because these exact words of God were very important. Verses 5 and 6. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. So Jacob gave the birthright to Joseph by adopting Ephraim and Manasseh to the rank of his firstborn sons, thus giving a double portion to Joseph. Thus they replaced Reuben and Simeon. Jacob's first two sons that were born to Leah in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 as well. It'll mention that. And so the recognition of Joseph's sons would have an effect on the apportioning of the land of promise years later in the days of Joshua when we get to Joshua chapter 16 and 17. And so this provides for a total of 13 to choose from, and it permits various listings to omit one for various reasons and still have a list of 12 tribes. And so Reuben and Simeon were the first and second born of Israel. Jacob received the two sons of Joseph as adopted into the family at the highest level, as if they were his own first and second born. And perhaps they were something similar to replacements for Reuben and Simeon, who were, in a sense, disqualified from positions of status and leadership in Israel's family because of their sin. Let's look at chapter 34, verse 25, which states, And it came to pass on the third day... When they were sore, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly, and they slew all the males. Right? You'll remember after Dina was raped, and they convinced these people to circumcise themselves, and they waited till they were in pain on the third day, and they slaughtered them. Uh, also in chapter 35, verse 22, it'll say, And it came to pass, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went to lay with Bila, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. And now the sons of Jacob were twelve. And so Jacob's adoption of Manasseh and Ephraim is going to explain why there are twelve tribes often listed in different combinations. Because of this adoption, there were actually thirteen sons of Israel. The twelve were born, but Joseph was divided into two tribes. And this follows in perfect when you get into Revelation as well. You'll see how that works. And so, therefore, as the tribes are listed through the Old Testament, they can be arranged in different ways and still remain 12 tribes. And there are more than 20 different ways of listing the tribes in the Old, in the Old Testament. And so, as a number, 12 is often associated with government or administration in God's eyes. There are 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 12 princes of Ishmael, 12 pillars of, on Moses' altar, 12 stones on the high priest's 
breastplate, 12 cakes of showbread, 12 silver platters, silver bowls, gold pans for the service of the tabernacle, 12 spies to search out the land, 12 memorial stones, 12 governors under Solomon, 12 stones in Elijah's altar, 12 in each group of musicians and singers for Israel's worship, 12 hours in a day, 12 months in a year, 12 Ephesian men filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, 12,000 from 12 tribes sealed and preserved through the tribulation period in Revelation, 12 gates of 12 pearls in heaven, and 12 angels at the gates, 12 foundations in the new Jerusalem, each with the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Its length, breadth, and height are all 12,000 furlongs, and the tree of life in heaven has 12 fruits. And so, the number 12 is quite special to God. Verse 7, But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way. But there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. So with lingering grief, Israel remembered the tragic death of his beloved wife Rachel at the birth of their son Benjamin. In chapter 35, verse 16 through 18, which says, And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benani, but his father called him Benjamin. And so Rachel's burial is going to be described in chapter 35, verse 19 and 20, which states, And Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Verses 8 through 12. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons, and he said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. So we remember that the names of Joseph's sons were Manasseh, the firstborn, and Ephraim, the younger. The name Manasseh means forgetfulness, and the name Ephraim means fruitfulness. In Genesis chapter 41, verses 51 and 52, where it says, And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And so Joseph lived as a high official of Egypt for many years, and he had no contact with his father during that time. Yet, it did not diminish the reverence that he had towards his fathers, or his father. He bowed down with his face to the earth. Verse 13 and 14. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And so the right hand in the Bible always has this idea of a favored position, because generally speaking, the right hand is the hand of strength and skill. And so the right hand is going to be associated with God's strength. In Exodus 15, verse 6, it'll say, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy. It also means uh, a position of favor. In Psalm 16, verse 11, it'll say, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And it's an indication of help in Psalm 20, verse 6. Now know that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. This is why Jesus is described as sitting at the right hand of the God the Father. In Mark 14, verse 62, where it says, And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. 
And so Israel knew exactly what he intended to do. By placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he intended to grant a greater blessing to the younger. And this was against normal custom and expectation. Verse 15 and 16. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So out of Jacob's long career... The book of Hebrews selects this blessing of Joseph's sons by the patriarch as his great act of faith in Hebrews 11 verse 21. And it was his reaching out for the continuation of God's promise in the face of death. Ironically, this is the very thing he had once accomplished by deception in chapter 27. So once more, the blessing were going to be uh, given to the younger, but this time there were no schemings or bitterness involved. It was an act of faith. And so Israel granted the blessing in deep awareness of the covenant that came from God's promise to his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. In blessing Joseph's sons, it could be rightly said that Israel blessed Joseph. Israel gave the same blessing to both sons, but the son of the right hand received a greater proportion of this blessing. And so this was also fulfilled in Israel's history, as we find out. Both tribes were blessed, but Ephraim was greater as a tribe, even to the point where the name Ephraim was used to refer to the whole northern nation of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 8, it will say, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 17, it will say, The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And chapter 11, verse 13 of Isaiah, where it will say, The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. And so Jacob's testimony was a testimony of grace, not personal merit. He did not say how faithful he was to God, but how faithful God was to him. The phrase, the God who has fed me, is literally rendered the God who has shepherded me. This is the first mention in the Bible of God as a shepherd to his people. And so the old man's voice faltered as he said, The God which fed me all my life long. The translation would be better if it ran, The God which shepherded me all my life long. Verse 17 through 20. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. So for Four consecutive generations, this reversed pattern was followed. Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Joseph over Reuben, and Ephraim over Manasseh. Years later, Ephraim became a leading tribe in the northern kingdom, as we covered, much superior to the tribe of Manasseh, as Jacob had predicted. And so, as the two sons of Joseph stood before Israel, the older, Manasseh, was before Israel's right hand, and the younger, Ephraim, was before Israel's left hand. And so Joseph positioned them intentionally so the older could receive the right hand blessing, according to the custom. Yet Israel deliberately crossed his hands and put his right hand on Ephraim's head and his left hand on Manasseh's head. And so Ephraim was not the firstborn, but God chose him to take the position of firstborn. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 9 described this, For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. And so this is going to show how the idea of firstborn in the Bible is often a position of preeminence, not necessarily meaning first out of the womb. 
David had the position of firstborn, even though he was the youngest son. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 11, it'll say, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he keeps the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And in Psalm 89, verse 27, it'll state, Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. And truly, David was Israel's greatest king. <clears throat> and so Jesus has the preeminent position of firstborn. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 will state, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Though this does not mean that Jesus was literally the firstborn creature of God, because Jesus was not created. Verse 21 and 22. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. So this was truly a passing of the torch from Israel to Joseph. Israel was the last of the great, uh, the three great patriarchs to pass from the scene. Right? And now that it's going to bug me, it's on my head. Right? You'll note that Jesus was the last Adam. He had Adam. And then Jesus will refer to himself as the last Adam, right? Being the firstborn. And so that's, that's really the point of like superseding. Adam came first, but Jesus ultimately is going to be the firstborn out from the dead, resurrected. Anyway, and so one portion above your brothers. So this is going to refer to Joseph being father of two tribes, while each of his brothers only fathered one each. In which I took from the hand of the Amorite. So apparently, while still in Canaan, Jacob battled for control of a portion of the land from these Amorites, and he deeded the land to Joseph and his descendants. The descendants of Joseph would take this land some 400 years later. And so, God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. This completed a wonderful work regarding Jacob's recognition of God's presence in his life. I am with you. In chapter 28, verse 15, God gives the young believer every possible assurance of his presence and grace. I will be with you. In chapter 31, verse 3, God expects the growing believer to trust that he will be with him, even when he only has the promise of his presence. God has been with me. Chapter 31, verse 5, God gives a glorious testimony to the mature believer, able to say how God has been with him even when he hasn't felt his presence in the way that he wished. And God will be with you, chapter 48, verse 21. God gives the mature believer the opportunity to encourage others with the promise of God's presence. And so let's look at Joseph as a picture of Jesus here. Joseph is one of the most remarkable portraits of Jesus, the Messiah, in all the Bible. In many ways, his life illustrated the future life and work of Jesus. And here are a few ways in which Joseph and Jesus are alike. All right? And Charles Spurgeon would say, There is scarcely any personal type in the Old Testament which is more clearly and fully a portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ than is the type of Joseph. He was a shepherd. He was loved by his father. He was sent unto his brethren. He was hated by his brothers. He prophesied his coming glory. He was rejected by his brothers. He endured unjust punishment from his brothers. He was sentenced to the pit. He was condemned to the pit, though a leader knew that he should go free. He was sold for pieces of silver. He was handed over to the Gentiles. He was regarded as dead, but he was raised out of the pit. He went to Egypt. He was made a servant. He, he was tempted severely, but he did not sin. He was falsely accused. He made no defense. He was cast into prison and numbered with sinners and criminals. He endured unjust punishment from Gentiles. He was associated with two other criminals. One was pardoned and the other was not. He showed compassion. He brought a message of deliverance in prison. He wanted to be remembered. He was shown to have divine wisdom. He recognized as having the spirit of God. He was betrayed by his friends. He was glorified after his humility. He was honored among the Gentiles while still despised or forgotten by his brethren. He was given a Gentile bride. He was 30 years old when he began his life's work. He, was, he blessed the world with bread. 
He became the only source of bread for the world. The world was instructed to go to him and do whatever he said to do. He was given the name God Speaks and He Lives. His brethren were driven out of their own land. In his second appearing, he did not first go to his brothers, but they came to him. He knew his brethren even while unknown and unrecognized by them, and he blessed his brethren without their knowledge. He wanted all of his brethren to come to him. There was a significant time gap between his initial relationship with his brothers and his second relationship to his brothers. He gave his brothers a way of deliverance through substitution. His second coming to his brothers had two appearances. He made himself known to his brethren at his second appearing to them. He was revealed as a man of compassion. His brothers repented of rejecting him with great amazement and tears. He allowed no fellowship, as in eating together, until his brothers repented and he revealed himself. His brethren went forth to proclaim his glory. He made provision for his brethren. He prepared a place for his brethren, and he received them into it. And he brought Jew and Gentile together in the land. You can find more study material at taylorbiblestudy.com.